Greek historian Herodotus said this is the work that united all of Elis in all of Greece. And that work is theogony or the theogony, meaning the genealogy of the gods. So this work, not that Hesiod uh, created the mythology, but he is the one that collected this work in the mythology that all Greeks basically agreed to as the genealogy and the story of the history of the cosmos and the gods. So in this video, I am going to read, that will be part one, the theogony, or theogony, the olgony, um, again, the genealogy of the gods. And a lot of the stories that you may recognize uh, that are in this work. In Sasuke, it'll be kind of funny to hear me try to pronounce some of the names of these gods and goddesses because there are going to be some that you've heard of and some you haven't. But you will recognize some of the stories. So I hope you enjoy this. It's going to be a part one, definitely a part two, and possibly a part three. I may be able to fit it all in in part two, but we'll see. Anyway, this is part one of Hesiod's probably greatest work. Let us begin of our singing from the Heliconian Muses, who possesses the great and holy mountain of Elicon, and dance there on soft feet by the blue water of the spring, and by the altar of the powerful son of Kronos, who washes their tender bodies in the waters of Permisos. The Hippocrene spring of the horse, or holy Olimios, and on the high place of Elicon, have ordered their dances, which are handsome and beguiling, and light are the feet they move on. From there they rise and put a veiling of deep mist upon them, and walk in the night singing in sweet voices and celebrating Zeus, the holder, the holder of the Aegis, and Era, his lady of Argos, who treads on golden sandals, and sing also Athene, the gray-eyed daughter of Zeus of the Aegis, and Phoebus, Apollo and Artemis of the showering, showering arrows, Poseidon who encircles the earth in his arms and shakes it, and stately Themis and Aphrodite of the fluttering eyelids, Ebe of the golden wreath, beautiful Dione and Leto and Epitos and the devious devising Kronos, Eos the dawn, great Ilios and shining Selene, Gaia the earth and great Okinos and dark night and all the holy rest of the everlasting immortals. It's beautiful poetry, actually, I, I love it. And it was they who once taught Isiod his splendid singing as he was shepherding his lambs on holy Ilicon. And these were the first of the words of all the goddesses spoke to me, the muses of Olympia daughters of Zeus of the Aegis. You shepherds of the wilderness, poor fools, nothing but bellies. We know how to say many false things that seem like true sayings, but we know also how to speak the truth when we wish to. So they spoke these great mistresses of words, daughters of the great Zeus, and they broke off and handed me a staff and a strong growing olive shoot, a wonderful thing. And they breathed a voice into me, and, a, and powerful to sing the story of things past and future. And they told me to sing the races of the blessed gods and everlasting, but always to put themselves at the beginning and end of my singing. But what is all this to me, the story of the oak and or the boulder? So it's interesting. It's kind of like a gospel story in a way that he's saying that he is the one that was chosen to deliver the message of the story and the, the uh, genealogy of the gods. You can believe that or not, but either way, you can't deny that Isiod's work has survived through the centuries and generations, so that part is interesting. Especially with how important this played into, uh, like I said, history, just of the Greek mythology itself. All right. 
So come you then, let us begin from the Muses, who by their singing delight the great mind of Zeus, their father, who lives on Olympus, as they tell of what is and what is to be, and what was before now, with harmonious voices, and the sound that comes sweet from their mouths never falters, in all their mansions, uh, on all the mansion of Zeus, their father, of uh, the deep thunder and joyful, in the light voice of the goddesses that scatters through it, in the peaks of the snowy Olympus, re-echo in the homes of the immortals, and they, in divine utterance, sing first the glory of the majestic race of immortals. From it begins those born to wide Uranus and Gaia, and the gods who were born to these in turn, the givers of blessing. The next they sing of Zeus, the father of the gods and immortals, and they begin the strain and end the strain singing of him. How greatly he surpasses all gods in might in the strongest. And then again, the Olympian muses, daughters of the ages wearing Zeus, delight his mind that, dwell, that dwells on Olympus. By singing the race of the humankind, and the powerful giants. Mnemosyne, queen of the Elithinian hills, bore them in Pyria when she had lain with a Cronian father. They bring forgetfulness of sorrows and rest from anxieties. For nine nights, Zeus of the council lay with her, going up in her sacred bed, far away from the other immortals. But when it was a year, after the seasons turning and the months had waned away, and many days were accomplished. She bore nine daughters, concordant of heart, and singing is all the thought that is in them, and no care troubles their spirit. She bore them a little way off from the highest snowy summit of Olympus, and there their shining dances places, dancing places, their handsome houses, and their graces and desire live there beside them in festivity. Lovely is the voice that issues from their lips as they sing of all the laws and all the gracious customs of the immortals and glorifying them with their sweet voices. At that time, glorifying in their power of song, they went to Olympus in immortal music and all the black earth re-echoed to them as they sang and the lovely beat of their footsteps sprang beneath them as they hastened to their father, to him who is king in the heaven, who holds in his hands the thunder and the flamey lightning, who overpowered and put down his father, Kronos, and ordained to the immortals all rights that is theirs and defined their stations. All these things the muses who have their homes on Olympus sang then, and they, they are nine daughters who Father Zeus is great. Cleo and Euterpe, Thalia and Melponini, Terpiscori and Erato, Polymenia and Urania, with Calliope, who all holds the highest position. For it is she who attends on the respected barons. And when on one of these kingly nobles, at the time of his birth, the daughters of the great Zeus cast their eyes and bestow their favors upon his speech, and they make distillation of sweetness. And from his mouth the words ran, run blandishing, and his people all look in his direction as he judges their cases with straight decision, and by unfaltering de declaration can put a quick and expert end even to a great quarrel. So the muses are the ones who bless the kings and give them great speech. And as you heard, it is Zeus that, that, that gave the gods their position and power. And that is why there are temperate barons, because for their people have gone astray in an assembly, these lightly turn, these lightly turn back their actions to the right direction and talking them over with gentle arguments. As such is one who walks in, through an assembly, the people adorn him like a god with gentle respect, and he stands out among all assembled. Such is the holy gift of the muses to give to humanity. So it is from the muses and from Apollo of the far cast that there are men on earth who are poets and players on the lyre. The lords are from Zeus, 
but blessed is the one whom the muses love for the voice of his mouth runs and is sweet and even when a man has sorrow fresh in the troublement of his spirit and is struck to wander over the grief in his heart the singer the servant of the muses singing the glories of ancient men and the blessed gods who have their homes on olympus makes them pres presently forget his cares and he no longer remembers sorrow for the gifts of the goddesses soon turn his thoughts elsewhere but it is the muses that grant divine inspiration so hail then the children of zeus and grant me lovely singing now sound out the holy stock of the everlasting immortals who came into being out of gaia in story in starry or in us and gloomy night whom pontos the salt sea brought to maturity and tell how at the first at how at first the gods and the earth were begotten in the rivers and the boundless sea raging in its swell and the blazing stars and the white sky above all tell of the gods bestower of blessing who were begotten of all these and how they divided the riches and distributed their privileges and how they took possession of many folded olympos tell me all this you muses who have your homes on Olympus from the beginning and tell who was first to come forth from among them. First of all, there came chaos. So here we go. So now we're talking about the genealogy of the gods and it all came from chaos. And after him came Gaia of the broad breast to be the unshakable foundation of all the immortals who kept their crests on snowy Olympus. And Tartarus, the foggy in the pit of the wide wide earth, and Eros, who is love, handsomest among all the immortals, who breaks the limbs' strength, who and all gods and all human beings overpowers the intelligence in the breast in their shrewd planning. So when it comes to adult time, it is Eros who is um, the one responsible for that, that the mightiest of kings to the lowliest of servants, when it comes to uh, many rituals, we'll say Eros is the great equalizer. I always like it when they say that Eros is the weakener of limbs. I want to say that that was um, Sappho who would say that about um, Eros or uh, Aphrodite as well. And it was always funny because, you know, it makes you weak in the knees just to put it lightly it's always funny when they used to say it was a loose nerve limbs when the weaker nerve limbs it was always humorous so from chaos was born erebos the dark and black night and from night again aether and Hemera, the day were begotten for she lay in love with erebos and conceived and bore these two but gaius firstborn was one who matched her every dimension or the starry sky to cover her all over to be unshakable standing place for the blessed immortals then she brought forth the tall hills and those wild haunts that are beloved by the goddess nymphs who live on the hills and in the forests without any sweet acts without any sweet sweet act of love she produced the barren sea pontos seething in his fury of waves and after this she lay with oranos and bore him deep swirling orkinos the ocean stream in koyos krios hyperion and ioptos and thea too and rhea and themis and nemosini phoebe of the wreath of gold and tethys the lovely i can already tell i'm going to mess up some of these names but i'm going to try to pronounce them as best as i can <laughs> i can tell you that right now um after these her youngest born was a devious devising chronos most terrible of her children and he hated his strong father she brought forth also kiki the oh uh, the kiki gold please which cyclops basically uh whose heart are proud and powerful Brontes and Steropes and Argis of the violent spirit, who made the thunder and gave it to Zeus and fashioned the lightning. 
which is interesting because also there's a myth about how Hephaestus created the lightning for Zeus. I've heard that one before. So, and here it is Brontes, Brontes and Steropes and Argus um, are the ones that created the lightning and thunder for Zeus. These and all the rest of their shape were made like the were made like gods, but they had only one eye set in the middle of their foreheads. Again, the Cyclops or the Cyclops, wheel-eyed was the name given by reason of the single wheel-eyed shape that was set in their foreheads. Strength and force and contriving skills were in their labors. The Cyclope, the Cyclopes. That's a hard word to say. But yes, yeah, Cyclops. Still other children were born to Gaia and Ornos. Three children, three sons, big and powerful, so great that they could never be told of. Kotos, Briorios, and Geese, overmastering children. Each had a hundred intolerably strong arms bursting out of their shoulders. And on their shoulders of each grew 50 heads above their massive bodies, also known as the Hecatochores. Um, so yeah, they had a hundred uh, strong arms bursting on their shoulders, and out of every shoulder grew 50 heads. Irresistible and staunch strength matched the appearance of their big bodies. In all of the children ever born to Gaia and Ornos, these were the most terrible, and they hated their father from the beginning. And every time each one was beginning to come out, he would push them back again, deep inside Gaia, and would not let them into the light. And Ornos exulted in his wicked work, but great Gaia groaned with, within for pressure of pain. And then she thought of an evil, treacherous attack. So it's funny, as they were being born, he was like, no, no, and he was pushing them back in. It's like, no more, please. Presently creating the element of gray flint, she made of it a great sickle. Here it comes. Speaking of Gaia, so to get revenge, she made a sickle out of flint. And explained it to her own children and spoke in the disturbance of her heart to encourage them. Quote, My son, born to me of a criminal father, if you are willing to obey me, we can punish your father for the brutal treatment he put on you. For he was first to think of shameful dealing. And so she spoke, but fear took hold of all, nor did one of them speak. But the great devious devising Kronos, Zeus's father, took courage and spoke in return and gave his gracious mother an answer. My mother, I promise to undertake this accomplishment and, and to accomplish this act. And for a father, him of the evil name, I care nothing. For he was the first to think of shameful dealings. So he spoke, and giant Gaia rejoiced greatly in her heart, and took and hid in him a secret ambush, and put into his hands the sickle. So this is going to be fun. If you don't know this story, this is interesting. So Yornos, or Ornos, the... Uh, as Kronos' father, Zeus's grandfather, um, like I said, was not wanting any more children, was literally pushing them back into Gaia. Gaia gives her son Kronos a sickle, which is still a symbol of Kronos actually now. So this is interesting. So if you wonder where the sickle Kronos uh, connection comes from. And something interesting is about to happen, we'll just say. So she puts the sickle in his hand, edge like teeth, and told him uh, all his treachery, all her treachery. And huge Uranus comes on bringing the night with him. And desiring love, he embraces Gaia and laid over, stretch over her completely. So they're about to do the deed, and this is going to happen. And from his hiding place, the son reached out with his left hand and seized him, his father, and holding in his right hand the enormous sickle and with his long blade <laughs> edged like teeth he swung it sharply and lopped the member off of his own father and threw it behind him to where they would but they were not lost away when they were flung from his hand but all of the bloody drops that went splashing from them were taken in by Gaia the earth 
with the turning of the seasons and she brought forth the powerful furies and the tall giants shining in their armor and holding long spears in their hands and the nymphs they call on boundless earth and the nymphs of the ash tree but the members themselves when chronos had lopped them off with the flint he threw them from the mainland into the great wash of the sea water and they drifted a great while on the open sea and there they spread in a circle of white foam from the immortal flesh and it grew a girl and we all know who this is going to be and maybe you don't but surprise if you don't know who of course first took her to holy Kirtheria or Kithera. and from these and from there she afterward made her way to the sea washed cyprus and stepped ashore, a modest, lovely goddess, and about her, light and slender, the feet, the grass grew, and the gods call her Aphrodite, or Aphrodite, and men do too, and the Aphrophone born goddess, the garland of Cytheria, because from the sea foam she grew, and Cytheria, because she had gone to Kithra and keep progenia because she came forth from wave washed cyprus and philomedia because she appeared from medea members and eros went with her and handsome hemeros attended her and when first she was born when she was joined the immortal community and here is the privilege she was given and holds from the beginning in which is the part she plays among men and immortal gods. The whispering together of girls, the smiles and deceptions, the delight and the sweetness of love, and the flattery. But their great father, Ernus, who himself begot them, bitterly gave to those others, his sons, the name of Titans. The stretchers, for they stretched their powers outrageously and accomplished a monstrous, a monstrous thing, and they would someday be punished for it. So interesting. So talks about the origin of the Titans. And right here, more than anything, the origin of Aphrodite, who came from the genitals of Oranos when Kronos lopped them off and threw them into the ocean. Aphrodite was born. And then you see that Eros attended Aphrodite. So those two have always been together. A very interesting story but night bore horrible moros and black cur end and fate and also the um lopping off of the genitals created the furies as well so that was the origin of the furies we just read another interesting thing and death and sleep and she also and she also bore the brood of dreams she dark night herself I had not been loved by any god. And then again, she bore mocking momos and painful oises. Um, so talking about Nyx, the night uh, is the mother of death and sleep. So Thanatos and Hypnos. And she also the, uh, bore the brood of dreams so morpheus and dark knight herself again had not been loved by any god and then again she bore maki momos and painful oisis and the hesperides who across the fabulous stream of the ocean kicked the golden apples and the fruit bearing orchids and she bore the destinies the mori and the cruelly never forgetful fates clotho lachesis in Atropos, who at their birth bestow upon mortals their positions of good and evil again the fates and these control the transgressions of both men and divinities and these goddesses never remit their dreaded anger unto whoever has done wrong gives them satisfaction and she destructive knight bore nemesis who gives much pain to mortals and afterward, cheating deception and loving affection. And then malignant old age, or Geras, is the god of old age. 
So she gave birth to Giris. An overbearing discord. Hateful discord in turn bore painful hardship and forgetfulness and starvation and the pains full of weeping. And the battles and the quarrels and the murders and the manslaughters and the grievousness and the lying stories and the dispu disputations and the lawlessness and ruin who shares one another's nature and oath who does more damage than any others to earthly men when anyone of his knowledge swears a false oath so he gave, she gave birth to a lot of troubles in the world but pontos the great sea was father of truthful Neris, who tells no lie eldest of his sons they came they called to him the great and they or should say they call him the old gentleman because he is trustworthy and gentle and never forgetful of what is right but the thoughts of his mind are mild and righteous and pontos again fathered great Themis and haughty forkis when he lay with gaia and he fathered cato and of their fair of the fair face and eurybia who has a heart of stone inside of her to Nereus and to Doris or Doris of the lovely hair daughter of Orkinos and the completely encircling river there were born in the barren sea daughters greatly beautiful among goddesses Ploto, Eucharanti, Emperate and Sio Eudoria and Thetis and Galena and Gloki Kimotoi and Spio and Theoi and lovely Halia. Pesithia and Rato, Yoniki of the Rose Arms and Graceful Meliti, Yulemini and Aguia, Doto and Proto, Danamini and Fiorosia, Nisia and Akiata and Protomedia. Doris and Panapia and, Gal <laughs> and Galatea, the beautiful Hepotia, the lovely, and Heponii of the rosy arms. So he's given literally the birth of all these gods and goddesses. So Kimodoki, who with Kimatoligia and then Amphitrite, light of foot on the misty face of the open water easily stills the waves and hushes the winds and the blowing Kimo and Yoni Helimidi of the bright garland Glaconomi the, la the lover of laughter and Pontiporia Leogori <laughs> and Iogori and Leomedia Polionoi and Otonoi and Leo Lysia Nasa, Lysia Nasa, and in your in of the lovely figure and face of perfection, Basamathe of the graceful form and shining Menapi, Niso Yopimo, sounds like um so many names it sounds like I'm conjuring something you know, Niso and Yopo, I can't even say it Yopopini, Yopompi. Niso and Eupompi, and Themisto and Peroni, and Nemeritis, whose mind is like that of her immortal father. These were the daughters born of approachable ne Nerus, 50 in all, Nereus, 50 in all, and actions they know are all beyond reproach also. Now Themis married a daughter of deep running Okinos, and Electra, and she born him swift footed Eris, the rainbow. I love the goddess Eris. So the god uh, says again now, Themis, the married a daughter of deep running Okinos Electra, and she bore him swift footed Eris, or Iris, the rainbow. Again, I, I, I always love the goddess of the rainbow. In the harpies of the lovely hair, so Okipiti and Elio, 
and these two in the speed of their wings keep pace with the with the blowing winds or birds in flight as they soar and swoop high aloft and to the forkis quito bore the gria with their fair faces and gray from birth and these the gods who are immortals and men who walk on the earth call graya the gray sisters Pemfredo robbed in beauty and Inyo robbed in, robed in saffron and the gorgons who beyond the famous stream of the ocean live in the utmost place towards night by the singing Hesperides and they are the Syntho, Ureli, and Medusa so these are the gorgons again so there are three uh, gorgons that are mentioned so Syntho, Ureli, and Medusa whose fate was a sad one. For she was mortal, but the other two are mortals, mortal and ageless, both alike. Beside and he of the dark hair lay with one of these, in the soft meadows and among spring flowers. But when Perseus had cut off the head of Medusa, there sprang from her blood great Crasor, and the horse Pegasus, so named from the Pagai, the spring of the ocean where she bore, was born. While Creosaur is named from the golden Ar, the sword he handles, Pegasus, or Pegasus, soaring, left the earth the mother of the sheep flock, and came to the immortals, and there he lives in the house of Zeus, carry, and carries the thunder and lightning for Zeus of the councils. Crasor married Caliori, daughter of glorious Okinos, was father to the triple-headed Giron, but Giron was killed by the great strength of Ericles. At a sea circled, at sea circled Erythia, beside his own shambling cattle on the day when Ericles drove those broad-faced cattle towards holy Tyrannies, or Tyrans, when he crossed the stream of the ocean and he killed Orthos in the ox herd Eurytion out in the gloomy meadow beyond the fabulous ocean. But she, Caliori, bore another unmanageable monster like nothing human nor like any other immortal god either in, hollow, in a hollow cave. And this was the divine haughty Echidna and half of her is a nymph with a fair face and eyes glancing, but the other half is a monstrous, monstrous snake, terrible and enormous and squirming and voracious. And there in Earth's secret places. It makes me think of um, on Hercules, the uh, legendary journeys. Echidna was called the mother of monsters. So um, this was the birth of Echidna also known as the mother of monsters. And again, she had half of her, her half of her was beautiful. It says she was a nymph with a fair face and glancing eyes. The other half was a monstrous snake that was terrible, enormous and squirming, voracious and there in the secret or secret places. For there she was in a, her cave on the undes, underside of a hollow rock, far from the immortal gods and far from all mortals. There the gods ordained her a fabulous home to live in which she keeps underground among the Aromoi. Grizzly Echidna, a nymph who never dies, and all her days is ageless. And they say that Typhon, the terrible, violent, and lawless, was joined in love with this girl of the glancing eyes, and she conceived and bore children to him with hard temp tempers. First she bore him Orthos, who was Girion's herding dog. And next again, she bore the unspeakable and unmanageable Kerberos, or Cerberus. So the mother and father of Cerberus, the famous dog, is Typhon and um, Echidna. So Kerberos, the savage, the brawn barking and dog of Aedes, 50-headed and powerful and without pity, which is interesting because we always hear about him being three-headed. In the third, she bore the grizzly-minded Hydra of Lerna, whom the goddesses of white arm era nourished because of her quenchless grudge against the strong Ericles. Yet he, Ericles, the son of Zeus, 
of the line of Amphitron by design of Athena, the spoiler, and with the help from warlike Aeolus, killed the beast with pitiless bronze sword. Hydra bored the Chimera, who snorted raging fire, a beast great and terrible, and strong and swift-footed. Her heads were three. Uh, one was that of a glaring lion, one of a goat, and the third of a snake, a powerful dragon. But Chimera was killed by Pegasus, and gallant Bellerphon. But Echidna also, in love with Orthos, mothered the deadly Sphinx, the bane of the Comedians, and the Nemean lion, whom Era, the queenly wife of Zeus, trained up and settled among the hills of Nemea to be a plague to mankind. There he preyed upon the tribes of the indwelling people and was king over Atritos, Apsis, and Nemea. Nevertheless, the force of strong Heracles subdued him.